Okay, well, time to get started here. So we're all good. I see I got my light on. So um, we're just going to pick up the very end of chapter 11. We didn't really talk about this little last couple of verses here. Uh, and then we're going to go into chapter 12. Um, and chapter 12 really is a big transition point because we leave Peter and Jerusalem all, all behind and from then on, it's all about, you know, um, Paul and um, Antioch and, and journeys and then his arrests and things. So everything from, from 13 on is about Paul, um, which I think fits with the idea that both Luke and Acts were written to give an explanation of not only Christianity, of who Christ was, but also of who the apostles were, of even what we see here in Acts uh, 11 is why the term Christian came about, or, or where anyway, and, and then just the explanation of what was happening and what the accusations were against Paul and a lot of his uh, contemporaries, but specifically Paul is the one who appealed to Rome. So. Um, anyway, before we really get into it, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer and then we'll kind of get started. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can, are able to gather together here in peace. But we know that uh, life has been very stressful uh, for many and, and for um, we understand that, that this year has been tough. Circumstances in lives have been, uh, have been difficult and, and the circumstances are around us along with you know, some of the circumstances of life have just compounded and made things even more difficult. We hope, Father, that you though, will give us peace of mind and heart, a peace that surpasses understanding, that we understand that this is but a moment and it shall pass. And we still, no matter what has transpired or what takes place, we still look forward to that day that you will tell us, you know, welcome, good and faithful servant, and welcome us into your eternal uh, home that you've prepared for us. We thank you, Father, for all of that. But we also know that as long as we have breath here in this life, that it is our privilege and honor to continue to serve you and put your son on that we might learn to be more like him and so as we study tonight uh, through the the book of acts we ask that you grant grant us wisdom to understand it and wisdom to see how it can help us make our decisions in life we thank you, Father, for this night. Thank you for the congregation. And we ask you to watch over and care for all those who are unable to get out, who, who, are, who are stuck and, and, and maybe alone. Help us all to overcome that and with each other's help. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Okay. Um, so we were told in, in you know, verse 26 that it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Um, and probably a lot of you have heard the presumption that people make that the term Christian was not self, uh, was not put on by the Christians themselves, since the term disciple or brethren is the one most commonly used in the New Testament. So we only have a few instances of the term Christian being used. Um, and it may be that outsiders were using it, that they were using this as a way to identify. And it might even have been Jewish people who weren't converts to Christ kind of all conjecture, by the way. But it might have been them saying they're they're not they're not part of us, you know that they're they're not they're not one of us they're not they're not a sect of Judaism which early on that's what the Greeks and Romans thought they were they thought it was a sect of Judaism, and and really it, from time Antioch really begins to grow and the time that they really begin to spread preach the gospel around 
you know, Greece and Macedonia and then all the way into Rome, uh, more and more the Roman Empire begins to see Christian, Christians as something different than the Jewish um, people. Um, now, it tells us, though, after, you know, Barnabas and Saul had basically in Antioch, there had been this great open door opened up for them, preach the word, teach a lot of people. And so they did that for a year. Um, and a great many people were being taught and churches growing. And it says that in those days, in verse 27, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And brothers really is what we often use as brethren. It's brothers and sisters concept. Um, he says, and they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Now, a couple of things about this just little, this little uh, blurb. Um, why, if the prophecy comes to them that there is going to be a famine over all the land, over all the world, and that, and that would most likely be all the world that they're, that they're aware of, you know, don't know if it's a worldwide thing or just a, a Mediterranean, you know, ocean thing, or, but it's going to affect all of them is, is what they've been told. Why are they only sending help to Jerusalem? If it's going to affect, if the famine's coming on all of them, why is it just the brethren in Jer Jerusalem that have the problem? Have you wondered that before? <laughs> Are you thinking that they were sending it there and that Jerusalem would then send the money in a broader area or just, no, no, just the, they just saw them that as the... Had been. <laughs> yes. One of the things, the third journey that Paul makes around um, from Ephesus all the way through Macedonia and Greece, and taking up a collection, that also is for the brethren in Jerusalem or Judea area. So probably not Jerusalem alone, but all, you know, Judea. Um, you had your hand up, though. So this is, this is not the same one as that, by the way. So there's multiple collections that were taken for the Christians in Jerusalem. Uh, so a couple of points that, you know, Ben really hit at there. First off, and, and this kind of goes back to even what Rich was saying, Jerusalem is the one that supported them. Many of these people who have now spread out throughout, went up to Antioch, went up to these other places, these Christians all had been for a while supported by people in Jerusalem. And that church took on... They all kind of helped each other out. We saw, we see early on in the book, right? Before the church splits, there was a lot of support going around. Well, who was given all that support? The people who were displaced from their homes or the people who were still at home? So probably a great deal of the financial burden fell on those who were from Jerusalem and Judea. And 
So they were the support. Paul makes this point, by the way, in a little bit in, in Corinthian letters, that one of the reasons the Gentiles and these others need to support them is because they, they, their faith came on their backs. <laughs> They're the ones that supported all that they know. They're the ones that, that allowed the, this message to go out to all the world. Um, and then the second point Ben made, I think, is the one um, that I, w I want you to think about. One of the reasons why Jerusalem would probably need more help in a time when, when maybe a lot of people might be suffering is how many were left when the church split and left? How many Christians were left in Jerusalem? We're actually told. So you have the apostles and, and their families, <laughs> but only the apostles were left. Everybody left but the apostles, we were told, in the book of Acts. So a church that had probably 10,000 or more Christians in it got to where there was a dozen or maybe including their families, a couple, three dozen? I don't know how many, you know, like if you count their, you know, their wives and kids or whatever that they might have. They, it's not... The church is really small. And the problem with that is what? What is the problem? And Ben kind of hinted at this a little bit. What would be their problem of not getting a fair shake in Jerusalem in a time of famine? Jesus spoke to this, by the way, the issue they would have. So what happened to most of these, what happened to most of these apostles and things in Jerusalem? from a Jewish perspective. Yeah. They would be excommunicated. So what that does, and I don't know if I, it's been a long, probably a while since I've talked about this. I usually talk about it in John 9 when uh, the blind man gets kicked out of the synagogue. Well, the being kicked out of the synagogue is not like being kicked out of not being able to go to church building. That's not what that means in Israel. Right? Now, in other parts of the world, that's about what that means. You can't go to the, their synagogue. But, you know, the, the, the local communities and the local governments, they're not run by the Jews, so they don't, they're not really, you know, uh, left out. But in Israel, being kicked out of synagogue means not only do they not employ you, they won't give you aid. They... It, you're marked and you're, you're dead to them. You're out. And so they don't have any local help. At least officially. <laughs> Maybe there were some people who still fought a lot of them who didn't join them, as we were told earlier. But the, and so they had had an issue there in Jerusalem. And, and most likely when the apostles were the only ones left, it most likely kept growing, right? You think the apostles stopped being effective? <laughs> probably not. They, started, they kept probably teaching and preaching new people. The church probably grew again. But they were now under, uh, um, they were probably having some issues that a lot of the other churches wouldn't have had at this time frame. No. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Any, any other thoughts there at all in, in just kind of this? Um, this is a really good line. I've kind of used it recently, I think, uh, in, kind of in, in sending out requests for help. I don't know if I did it in the most recent one, but uh, sometimes, you know, we send out these requests. You know, we get a lot of requests from people who could use help, right? So occasionally we look at them and go, okay, well, this seems like, this is worthwhile. We can check the people out. We know the people. Are we? Uh, and so, you know, this is the this is the need. This is the situation. If you can help, we're going to take a collection for this these people, these these brethren, these whatever. And it's like you do it according to ability. If you have it, you have it. If you don't, you don't. It's not. Um, there's no necessity there. Um, it's just it's just kind of an ability thing um, now and we do know like the Paul mentioned in uh, especially second Corinthians 
that the people of Macedonia, they, they did that, but they went above and beyond. Sometimes even out of their poverty, they were, they were like, they were already poor, but they're like, ah, I can do by with, I can get by with a little less. And, and they were giving even in their poverty. So um, doing with a little less so that they could help out others. Uh, because that's really the, that's the attitude uh, that the early church was teaching all of us to try and have. So, um, okay. Uh, any, any other thoughts at all about that part of it? So we get, we're going to wind up here, uh, but I do want you, a couple things I want you to notice. So it says, um, in, again, in verse 30, 25, that, you know, we have Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. I don't know if you've had ever paid attention that Saul is called Saul all the way through from the time you first meet him in chapter 8 there, or end of 7, I guess. Um, and then in 8, he's called Saul all the way through here. And then he's going to be called Paul after this. And I'm actually going to, something I learned today about those two names that I'm going to share with you, but um, that I, I didn't know beforehand. Uh, something I, I read today in, 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 uh, about his two names that I, I was not aware of. But, um, so, so, but I, I only make this point because there, in chapter 11, in him and Antioch being called Saul for a year, there's already been a lot of years. He's already been a Christian for a number of years, hasn't he? Remember, he spent three years in Arabia before this, and he was at Tarsus for a while. So he's got four or five years, probably, since he's been a Christian. He didn't change his name to Paul because he didn't want to be that old Saul guy who was, you know, um, persecuting the church. For years, he's still called Saul. But in those years, he's primarily still mostly around Jews. So even the church in Antioch, a lot of them came from Jerusalem, right? So they started preaching to the Hellenists, but the leadership is, seems to be mostly Jewish. They have mostly Jewish names um, that are mentioned uh, when we get to there. Um, but Saul is his Hebrew name, Okay. Paul is not Hebrew. And so we'll look at it in a minute. Um, so anyway, so we come back to Jerusalem. This is kind of the last little bit. We're going to have Herod is going to kill James and arrest Peter. Uh, it says, about that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. These are the sons of thunder. So this is not James, the brother of Jesus, or who is called the elder in Acts 15. This is the apostle who is John's brother. So John, we, be, we believe, is the apostle who lives the longest. And his brother is the first martyr of the apostles. Not of all Christians, but, but of the apostles. And... Um, so, because James is a name that sometimes gets people all kind of twisted around the letter. When you, when you go and look at the background of who wrote the book of James, they'll discuss three, four different James. <laughs> like, it could be this James, it could be that James. Sometimes those James are the same James. It's like, there's all kinds of conjecture about all that. Um, anyway, so he killed James with the sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, this Herod is not Herod the Great. This is his son. Okay? So he's only uh, ruling over um, one portion of Herod's uh, empire, which is really all of Israel. So he's ruling over a portion of it, and, and another portion went to another one of the um, kind of offspring. And, uh, but so Herod, um, he, he's just about the same as his dad. His dad was just an awful, awful person in terms of human history. Uh, human history. He killed his own children. And did he even kill a wife at one point? I'm trying to remember now. Seems like he even might have killed a wife. He, he was afraid they would take over his 
spot on the throne. I mean, he, he, wouldn't, he didn't even want his own family to usurp his throne. <laughs> He was a ruthless, ruthless um, dictator. I mean, he had an emperor over him in, in Rome, but as far in terms of keeping, you know, and ruling over uh, Palestine, he was uh, he was brutal and ruthless. Um, his sons weren't really any better, um, and so when he realizes, well, you know, people all like this me killing <laughs> James, so he arrests Peter. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. So that's 16 soldiers, by the way. A squad is four, and so four groups of four. And so there would always be four guarding him. They would all have a, uh, a six-hour shift, okay, um, throughout 24, you know, 24-7. And so these uh, soldiers guard him, and and intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So the Passover and, and, and unleavened bread are really kind of joined at the hip. In the, in, the law of God, in the law of Moses, they're really separate things that become one thing. So they become an eight-day festival that starts with the Passover and has seven days of unleavened bread. But the Passover is also a day of unleavened bread. So, but it really is these eight days and um, they don't want to execute people during those, during that time. In fact, you remember one of the things that was asked about Jesus, why they wanted to get Jesus and the two uh, people he was that crucified next to him off the cross? It's because at 6 o'clock it was starting, right? And they didn't want the holy days to have these two people dying there. So they broke the legs of the two men so that they would die quicker. Jesus was already dead, so they didn't have time. But they burned them all down. And they buried them very quickly, very quickly. I mean, it's like they wrap them and throw them in the grave. So before this, because at 6 o'clock, you know, roughly our time, their, their day would start and that they wouldn't want to be touching the dead bodies. They wouldn't want to be... Uh, having the dead people out uh, during these holy days. And so that's what the, he's going to wait for. I've always thought that Peter was arrested. I don't know if th you've had this thought. In my mind, when I thought about Acts 12, and I, and I kind of can kind of picture my way through most of the book of Acts, what's happening all throughout the book. And in Acts 12, I've always thought, okay, Peter was arrested, and then he was released by the angel. And I've always thought of it being that night. But actually, that doesn't say that. We don't know how many days he was in there. They were waiting till the festival was over to kill him, to execute him. So he could have been. Now, he's released the night before he's going to be executed. <laughs> but we don't know how many nights he was in there. So it doesn't really tell us that. So it could have been a number of nights that he was... Uh, he was in prison waiting for it to be over and to be executed. Um, and so he was kept in prison because it tells us in verse 6, now when Herod was about to bring him out, he says, on that very night, Peter was slipping, sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. So this is how the, the, the squad worked. Two of the squad would be chained to the prisoner and two of them would guard the door. Now, why, why such extremes? And then you're going to get it at the end of this story. Why are the soldiers so intent on making sure they're like chained to this guy and he can't get away? Because if he did get away, they would be dead. Yeah. And these four guys, because Peter is released, they will all be executed. Or at least it tells us the order came down for them to be executed. And that was normal. Soldiers who had a prisoner, if that prisoner escaped, would be executed. That was their, that by the way, when we get to the chapter about the Philippian jailer, it's why the Philippian jailer is about to kill himself. He wasn't, he wasn't suicidal. He was like, I don't want to be killed by the Romans. So I think I'll just kill myself. So, you know, I don't have to suffer their execution. And that's when Paul will stop him. Because he, remember, he, he wakes up and realizes the jail's open. And he's like, uh-oh, <laughs> they've all gotten out. And I'm dead, man. 
And that's why, and, and he only would need one of them to get out to be a dead man. He doesn't need all of them to get out to be a dead man. And so it's one of the reasons why Paul telling him, no, we're all still in here, come in here, why it made such an impression probably on that Philippian jailer is because it's like they had the opportunity to leave and they didn't leave. They stayed there with these two guys chained up, singing hymns to God, you know. Anyway, um, so an angel of the Lord stood next to him and, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. He went out and followed him. Um, he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. Now, there's a couple of things about this statement. He thinks he's seeing a vision. What do you think that implies about this situation and the visions he's already had? So we know, he's, we know of at least one vision he's had. What does it tell us about the visions and this situation? For some reason, I always think of it as almost like he's the third person. Like he's almost watching this happen? Yeah. And maybe there was something else there, and that's why the guards <laughs> didn't immediately react to him being gone. Yeah. So I, get, I, I don't know what, why, why I have this impression. I get the impression that the angel's like, okay, I'm going to make sure all the guards are sleeping and they can't wake up. <laughs> <laughs> That no matter what I'm doing here, chains are going to fall off. And they're, but, they, you know, they're like, okay, sleeping potion. <laughs> That's just my image in my head, that they're in a sleeping potion. They're in sleeping spells, and they can't wake. You know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to take Peter out of here. Um, any other the thoughts about it, though? Because I think it implies something about visions. Really real. Yeah. So the vision where he had, he, when he's shown all these animals, he's told to stand up and eat and kill them and eat them. That wasn't, if that looked just like this, <laughs> that looks pretty real. I mean, if he couldn't tell the difference, it tells you how clear visions were. They were not a dream. <coughs> Because visions and dreams, are, God spoke to people in both ways. And visions typically is when people were awake and got visions. But the visions typically tell us, I mean, they, they seem to be really vivid. Rich, again. Well, I was going to say that, you know, part of the John where he says when he came to himself, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of like, here he is in the middle of the street. And yeah. like, oh, I guess I wasn't dreaming. Like, I wasn't, wait. You know, that, that wasn't a vision? I'm not in, I'm, oh, I'm really actually out here. And, Interesting. And after his vision of the, uh, you know, these tarp being let down with all the, you know, the, the, the animals, yeah. You know, it, it talks about him being perplexed. Right. It was like something happened. Sure. He's trying to reason out what it was. Yeah. Well, this time, it, he's not having to reason it out. It's just a, whoa, this really did happen. Yeah. An angel just came and got me and released me from prison. Because <laughs> what do you think Peter's thinking in jail there, with chained to these guards and about to be executed the next day? Yeah, he he was gonna... Why wouldn't he think he's going to be executed? James has already been killed, Gandhi. Because he was sleeping. Hey, well, yeah, he was sleeping soundly, too. Yeah, he didn't seem to be too worried. He wasn't worried about it. Yeah, because well, I, I, I do think it's just like, you know, it, it, it's, it's the first John, which I talked about a little bit Sunday, you know, perfect love pushes out fear. And, and they, didn't be, they weren't afraid of dying. In fact, the early Christians were not afraid of dying. The early Christians put themselves in a lot of harm's way, not only physically to be killed by people, but to be killed by disease and things too. The Christians were the ones who went and treated lepers, who went to leper colonies and took care of them. The Christians were the ones that took care of babies thrown out in the dump and, and, and took them in and fed them. Christians were the ones that did things that nobody else in Roman society did. And they did a lot of it at the threat of dying from disease. 
most of these, a lot of the people were thought to, oh, you know, these are all diseased, these are all, they all, you know, they're all have to be out, and, and the Romans wouldn't touch them, the Jews wouldn't touch them. And the Christians touched people, and served people, and treated people, and did things for people, and some of them died because of the, doing those things, <laughs> you know, um, and they didn't, they weren't afraid of that which was very different from the rest of the world. Somebody have their hand up. Yeah. I think, too, that, uh, it, you know, going back to John 21 and verse 18, when, when Jesus spoke to Peter, you know, and asked him three times if he loved him, he does tell him that, that he says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and you walk the way you wanted. But then he also says, but when you were old, <laughs> There's been a number of years. I don't know how maybe he feels old. <laughs> yeah, maybe. That's a yeah. Did he did he remember when you're old? You're not. So was he thinking? Oh, this is what he meant when I was older. Because <laughs> he most likely this time frame. He's probably post 40, would be my guess. I mean, that's a guess, but it's been quite a few years since the beginning. You know, and, you know, was he, was he similar in age to Jesus? I always kind of picture that, at least close. So, I don't know. Did he, did, was he's like, okay, I, yeah, I'm not old, I'm 40. And which no 40 year old really thinks they're old. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Old, be, old is, a, is a term that is always older than you presently are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I kind of think, would he have remembered that? I don't know. Maybe. I, I think either way his faith was strong. Yeah, I don't think it would have mattered either way. I think he was like, if this is it, this is it, that's fine. If it's not it, that's fine. I don't think he would have forgotten that if he understood it. Yeah, I just, I don't know if, it, was it specific enough for him to go, oh, that means post-60? No. But that means, I, yeah, I, I don't know. remember if, if he understood it. Right. Which they often didn't. Right. Understand what right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure he wouldn't have. I'm sure he'd remember what was told. I don't know that he would. Would he have known exactly what it meant, though? I don't know. And this is the thing about prophecies. Most people, even the apostles, were, and even a lot of the prophets, they were not told. They were not given the explanation of the prophecy. They often had to work them out themselves. A prophet did not always know what a prophecy meant. So a prophet wasn't always the one that had the explanation. In fact, when, it, when you, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, when it talks about all the gifts of the Spirit, so one of the gifts of the Spirit is prophecy, right? But what's one of the other ones? Interpretation. Interpretation. Interpreting. Explaining. Discerning. So one person, I've been told what to tell you. Blah, 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 blah. And it's, you go, I don't know what it means. I, just told, I was told to tell you that. <laughs> Somebody else comes out, oh, this is what God says it means. <laughs> like, Oh, okay. So, but we, and we can see that, by the way, even the high priest prophesied about Jesus' death. The high priest did not understand the prophecy <laughs> that he gave about Jesus' death. Um, so, anyway, the, um, it, it tells us something about how impactful visions were and how real they were. They were not, they're not, they were not something that was like a dream. You know how when you wake up from a dream, you have it doesn't take very long before you have trouble remembering it? You kind of initially might remember it, and then you go, okay, what were the details? It doesn't take very long before they kind of fade away. That's not what visions were. Revelation is essentially a vision that is given to John. He writes it in explicit detail, doesn't he? <laughs> And he was told to write down what he saw. He knew what he saw. He knew what he heard. 
It was very, very clear. Okay. Um, so when they passed the first and second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out, went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself and said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, uh, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Now remember, the mother of John already lost their son James. And so this, these Christians are gathered here and they're praying, they're praying for Peter. And, and they're praying, do you think they're praying with an expectation that Peter will be released and not be killed? No, because when they see him, they think he's already dead. Yeah, so they, they're surprised when he shows up. So are they praying that he's strong, that he's courageous, that he's faithful to the end? that maybe God could save him, but they don't necessarily know if that will happen or not. Jesus wasn't saved. James wasn't saved. <laughs> Stephen wasn't saved. It's not like they're expecting everybody to be saved. And not only that, it isn't just that a few people have died. Paul, you know, he kind of did his thing too to the church. But Jesus himself had told them, you're going to be persecuted like I was. So there was somewhat of an expectation amongst Christians that they would have to die, sometimes by others, and they would often die that way. There was that expectation in this early church that life was not going to be easy, wasn't going to go smooth, they weren't going to go to the grave in a nice, peaceful old age. Okay. Might happen to some of them, there wasn't necessarily an expectation that it would happen to all of them. Um, now, um, so Peter, um, you know, he's standing there. He knocked at the door of the gateway. Picture a house that has a fence around it, and in that fence is a gate, and that's what he's knocking on. He's not knocking on the door of the house. He's knocking on the gate to get in the courtyard that would then lead to the house. But that's most likely where this uh, servant uh, girl is, Rhoda. Um, and when he knocked, the servant girl came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning uh, to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Who's James here? So with a couple of James, right? There's a couple of James left. We had James, the, the, the son of thunder, the brother of John, who's already gone. There's James, the Lord's brother, who be, is... is it becomes actually historically famous for his presence in Jerusalem um, and the way he was killed by the Jews. Such, so He was so well thought of, the James who writes the book of James, he was so well thought of that many Jews thought the fall of Jerusalem happened because the Jews had killed James. So there's that James, who is most likely a James in Acts 15, who is called an elder but there's another James. Who's the other James? So James, the son of Zebedee, son of thunder, but then you have James the less. The lesser James. Could you imagine having the nickname the lesser one? He was short. He was little Jimmy. <laughs> He's little Jimmy? <laughs> little Jimmy, okay. That'd be the nice way, maybe, <laughs> thinking about it. Um, so anyway, so... I, I think it's probably James that shows up in, in Acts 15 that he's referring to here. I think that's the one Galate, in the book of Galatians. Paul makes mention of the fact that he saw James, John, and Peter as the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. That they were the ones who really were the driving force of what was happening in the church there. But who knows? 
Um, but it's not James, the son of thunder, or the brother of John. So it's one of the other two that we know of. Um, but he's telling them, listen, go tell them what happened. And he departed and went to another place. And it says, when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered they should be put to death. And then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Um, so Peter leaves. <laughs> he heads out. Um, at this point, we don't know where Peter goes. Peter is not discussed ever again in Scripture, really, other than in his own letters that he mentions writing from Babylon. Of course, in his day, the real Babylon is, is ruins. There's actually no city there. And so some think he's being literal. I think majority probably think he's referring to Rome, which his History says that he eventually ended up in Rome. And he died there in the 50s or 60s, mid-60s. I think, I think 66-ish, something like that. Um, about the same time as Paul, by the way, um, most likely. No. Um, anyway, we basically, with this little story, we never describe Peter again. Isn't that kind of a weird way to just leave off one of the most, I mean, this, this letter just like, okay, we're not going to talk about him anymore. <laughs> and it just, we're moving on and we're going to talk about Paul. Scripture lets him ride off into the sunset. <laughs> yeah. Flee from the posse. He, he did it very slowly. More, more like fleeing in, in the morning light from the posse chasing him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, okay, we have just a few more minutes here. Um, any any th thoughts or questions just about this whole event, Peter's uh, rescue? Yeah. I would have been curious what it signified if it's his angel. It's a good question. I wish I had a great answer for you. <laughs> My suspicion is they think... He's, I think Ben kind of hinted at it with what he said, that they think he's probably dead, but, and that, he, that he's in a sense, he's essentially kind of like a ghost, a spirit. But I don't know for sure. <laughs> that is a, that's just a guess. Do they mean it like, Jesus, well, because she's saying, the thing is, she's saying, I'm hearing him, I'm hearing him. Oh, that's his angel. That's his messenger. Well, why would his messenger sound like him if it's not actually some kind of spirit version of him? <laughs> and so, but if it's, just like a, if it's just like an angel of his that watches over him, why would, why would that sound like him? So I don't know. But it, it is an interesting thing to think about. Because Jesus himself said, you know, that the children have their angels, right? So God has angels kind of assigned to people, doesn't he? How many, how many, assign, how many angels per person? I have no idea. <laughs> is it one per person or is it one for a hundred of us? I don't know. I have any idea. It probably, we know it doesn't take very many angels to take care of like 180,000 people. So... You know, he only needed a couple of angels to kind of take care of a whole army way back when. So it's not like if, if we had one angel look over you know, all of us, it would still be plenty, right? <laughs> anyway, I, 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 we should know that God has angels watching over us. But he, I don't know that we know too much details about it other than that. Revelation says one per church. One per church? <laughs> of course, is that... That, that term for angel there, is it a messenger to the church or is it an actual spiritual being to the church? As soon as you answer what Peter says, I'll answer you what Revelation. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I, have said, like I have taught a number of times, you have to, from the context, determine what he means, whether he's talking about a physical people or some kind of spiritual being. Um, so 
the uh, I tend to think he's talking about people who are actually taking letters to all those churches, but that's just. But maybe, maybe there's one per church. But isn't there only one church? Huh? <laughs> no. In, in Revelation, there were seven of them, so. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> okay, well, we'll go ahead and end there. Um, we'll, we'll just kind of hit on the death of Herod a little bit. And I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the death of Herod next time, uh, because Herod's death is actually recorded by Josephus. Um, about actually what happened from, from a human perspective, what they saw versus what's recorded here. So they're, they're, they overlap, but they come at it from different perspectives. So one comes at it from God's perspective, an angel's perspective, and another one comes at it from a human being looking at Herod's perspective. And so they both describe his death happening at this particular feast. Um, but, and I believe you'll see that in chapter 13, when we're going to get into it next week, I want you to notice when Saul is no longer called Saul, and we're going to use the term Paul. And um, so in 13, it will tell us that. And then for the rest of the book, he'll just call him Paul. Anyway, but I will, I do have some, I think some, something I learned today about the two names that I didn't know before. And so... Um, I think it'll be new to a lot of you. We'll see. If you're if you're really, um, you know, gung ho, you can go kind of like research it before next Wednesday. If you're not, you just wait till I say so. <laughs> okay, uh, Brian, right? You got the singing. Uh, Dave's got the announcements, and you've got the closing prayer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good evening. Song number 415. Number 415. Each step I take.
approach to song number 555. Number 555. Good evening, everyone. So I've had over the last few months, I've had several topics come to mind that I would like to talk about, but I'm not going to talk about them all tonight. Uh, there's been questions or thoughts come up or things that I've heard um, over, over the last so many months that, that make me feel like, like some are, you know, they, they doubt they're standing before God. And, and uh, I always get concerned about that uh, because of maybe uh, not really understanding some things from the scriptures. And I would like to eventually, uh, probably my next time I get to speak for 30 minutes instead of five, I would like to talk about those things. But they kind of converge in one area that I kind of want to touch on. And, and I didn't put a, a lot of time into this because it brings up a lot of questions for me. But I, I wanted to go uh, along with this because it, it came up in Hebrews class a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it's, uh, we were in Hebrews 10, starting at verse 11, talks about the uh, sacrifice of Jesus Christ, uh, contrasting it with the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And when Jesus came, he offered that one sacrifice. The one sacrifice was sufficient for all time and for every one. And uh, starting at verse 11, it says, And every priest stands daily, at, or Hebrews 10, starting at verse 11. And every priest stands daily at, at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered all for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made his, a footstool for his feet. For by a single offer, offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us uh, for, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will rem remember their sins no more, their lawless deeds no more, where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And then the verse I think that that, uh, that really kind of sets off some thoughts in, in your mind is, therefore brothers or brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean, with an evil conscience, or from, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. And I was thinking about this idea of, uh, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. A lot of us that were raised in King James uh, Version Bible, uh, having, therefore, uh, brethren, boldness to enter into the uh, highest or holiest by the blood of Jesus. I think sometimes maybe it's hard for us to imagine that we can actually stand before God uh, in boldness or in confidence. And uh, I'm thinking a lot of times of me standing before God with my quaking knees and my sinful self because we all know who we really are, right? We know who we are, what we think about, uh, the things that we do, and uh, we can't imagine sometimes that we could possibly stand before God with boldness or, or confidence. But we enter, into the, enter boldly into the presence of God, and, and uh, it's represented in the scriptures here really by the Holy of Holies. It's the presence of God. But the confidence that, that it's talking about here, this boldness, uh, I think a lot of times our minds are drawn to the idea of bravado, uh, that there's self-confidence involved in that and that there's maybe a little bit of arrogance there. Look what I've done sort of thing. And, and so we're able to stand before God because look at what, look at what I've done. A lot of us have self-confidence in the things that we do. Uh, I'm a pretty good RV technician. I have a lot of self-confidence when it comes to that particular sort of thing. And I know you all have uh, different professions, uh, even mothers at home. Uh, you know very much what you're doing or learning what to do, right? Uh, and, and you grow self-confidence in taking care of your children 
uh, various people here that that have your uh, have your occupations uh, hunter uh, painter uh, Frank uh, self-confidence in his remodeling and carpentry and we all have that sort of thing but when it comes to standing before God we never come before him with self-confidence because we don't have anything that's great to offer before God it's not a confidence that comes from myself. It's really a, confident, a confidence that comes from him and whether or not we believe the promises that he's, that he's given to us. Coming into the presence of God, I think a lot of times we also think of it as something that's gonna happen in the future. But when that blood, when that sacrifice was made and we became Christians, we're there already. We're standing in the presence of Christ right now. And we should have that confidence uh, that confidence because God has given us precious promises uh, having to do with our salvation and all. God says through the Hebrew writer, Hebrews writer, that we are there already. And our response to that, though we might be shaking, is, is knowing that, yes, I should be here because God has promised this to me. So I think that a lot of times it's still kind of a, a tough concept because here again, we know who we are, we know what we think about, we know what we do. There's three songs that we sing, uh, and there's particular verses that, that stand out to me, and, uh, and I want you to just always consider these things. And I mentioned before in the song, It Is Well With My Soul, uh, for years growing up, we always skipped the third verse. And uh, the third verse is the best verse of the song, and uh, it says, My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. So do we believe that? It's not an inspired writing, but it reflects the inspired writing from the scriptures. Also, we sang this last week before the throne of God. The second verse in one particular book that I first copied the music from, the second verse is left out, and I think it's one problematic phrase in the middle of it that I think is explained through the rest of the verse. And I think you probably recognize it, but to me this is the same sort of thing. Uh, this actually attacks whether or not we're gonna have confidence or not. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, it's then I look to see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Then there's a song that we've sung for years also, um, And Can It Be? Boldly I come before your throne to claim your mercy immense and free. It's accepting those promises. It's believing what he's told us. No greater love will e'er be known, for oh my God, you found out, it found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? So we sing these things all the time. Do we really believe them? Do we stand before God confidently because he's promised to us and, and here we are, yes, I'm here because God invited me and he offered that sacrifice and I accepted the invitation. This time let's uh, stand and sing the song that was chosen.
Friday, Tara is going to have oral surgery, so please keep her in your prayers. We'll now have our closing prayer. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for giving us this time, this hour to be together, to take your word, to parse it and to absorb it into our hearts and to study it uh, as we're shown in the uh, example, the Bereans and many of the uh, early uh, first century Christians meditated upon your word and we take our instruction from their zeal to want to understand you, to understand your um, love for us. And we do examine ourselves because we're, we're seeing that that example exists, that we look at our lives, Father, and we know that we're told that with these tremendous promises that you've given to us, that we should come boldly in those promises. But help us, Father, always to be mindful of what mercy and grace that you exhibit through having given your son, which was the most painful of all, to sacrifice him to carry our sins because it could not be done in any other way to then help us, Father, to understand the gravity of the sacrifice you made and that we carried that on our backs as responsible for his death and his burial, but also because of your power, his resurrection gives us this hope and this promise. So help us to be mindful of the boldness, but also the humility of this gift that you've given to all of us. We pray, Father, for the leadership of this country. We know that you are in charge, and that you direct the affairs of all men and all leadership. And we pray for our little congregation here, for our families, extended families, and all the brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray for Tara, for those who are seeking treatment for their illnesses right now. We pray for Julie and so many other of us who have been impacted by illness recently and injury, that you will be with all of them. We thank you for the gift of our Lord and for your word. And we love you so much, Father. We hope that you feel this heart that beats within all of us, that honors you and worships you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.